Well, hey everybody, Happy New Year's Eve, CF family. My name is Omar, and I serve as lead pastor here at Christ Fellowship Church. And I'm here with my wonderful wife, Ashley, and our two uh, beautiful children, Camila and Mateo. Yes, and we're just so thankful that you are joining us this New Year's. And right where you are, wherever you are, at home, visiting family, we're just so grateful and so thankful that you have chosen to watch this morning with us. You know, as you can see today, we're fully online. And so we hope that you are uh, getting a week of rest and enjoying yourself with your family today. And also, I want to give a special thank you to all of our volunteers and our staff that so faithfully serve us throughout the year. And so hope you're getting some rest as well. Yeah, and if you're new here today, we would love to connect with you. And the best way to do that is by filling out a connection card by going to cfmiami.org slash connect. And because it's your first time, we're going to email you a special gift as our way of thanking you for being our guest today. And we want to encourage you, if you're not already, follow us on social media at CF Miami on all the social platforms so you can stay up to date on everything that's happening. And listen, our mission here at Christ Fellowship is very simple is to help you and your family follow Jesus, which includes our little ones, which are really the next generation. Uh, that's why this year, our Christmas offering that I shared with you earlier this month, uh, is called For Our Children, because everything that we collect this year in our Christmas offering is gonna go for our children. And it's gonna go to really do three important things. First of all, it's gonna renovate all of our CF Kids facilities here in Miami-Dade County, as well as we're gonna be sending money to our global campuses so that our global campuses, CF Kids also could be renovated. And then last but not least, we would like to expand CF Academy at the Palmetto Bay campus to a middle school in the future, and then also across all of our campuses as well. And so listen, even though Christmas time is over, uh, you can still give. In fact, you can go to cfmiami.org slash for our children. And there you can still give to the Christmas offering up to December 31st, all right? And so if you would like to give your normal giving to end the year, you can also go, uh, go to cfmiami.org slash give, or you can scan the QR code on the screen right now and it will take you uh, to that website. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much for your generosity this entire year. You know, it's because of your faithful giving week in and week out uh, that we get to do such great things here in Miami and reach people for Christ. And so thank you so much for your giving. Absolutely. And so I think service is about to get started, but wait, before you press pause, parents of littles, I want you to head over to watch our CF Kids Miami where? YouTube. On YouTube. On YouTube. Yes, we have some amazing content for littles that they can watch while you guys enjoy yeah. service. And if you have a middle schooler or high school, head over to our social media and there's some cool content there for you as well. Definitely. And so listen, it's time to get ready for worship. And so grab your entire family. I got to find my tail. I don't know where he's at right now. Let's grab our families together and let's get ready to worship our great God. See you soon. Christ Fellowship, welcome wherever you're watching from today. Well, listen, let us give praise to our God for He deserves it. And you see, let's end the year off in the right way. Come on. Praise in the valley, praise on the mountain. I'll praise when I'm sure. Praise when I'm doubting. 
Father, Lord, we take you at your word because your word is steadfast and sure. Lord, we trust you. We trust you you with all of our yesterdays and all of our tomorrows. Lord, may we look to you as the keeper of our strength as we look to this new year. Come on. in Psalms 103 says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Come on, let's be in reflection of all that the Lord has done for us, especially through Christ Jesus. Come on. See 
On the hill of Calvary, my Savior bled for me. My Jesus set me free. And look at the wounds that give me life. Grace flowing from his side, no greater sacrifice. What he's done, what he's done, all the glory and the honor to the Son. My sins are forgiven, my future is held.
Amen. What a beautiful song. I love the song that we just sang, specifically those lyrics, right? My sins are forgiven. My future is heaven. I thank God for what he's done. Listen, if you're thankful for what the Lord has done in your life, right where you are, just type it in the chat box that I'm thankful for what the Lord has done. If you're watching with your family or your friends, turn to your neighbor, high five them. Say, I'm thankful for what the Lord has done. And listen, if you're watching by yourself, it's all good. There's no shame. High five yourself. Sometimes you just need to encourage and remind yourself that you are thankful for what the gospel has done in your life, that your sins are forgiven and that your future is heaven. I thank God for what he's done. And the church said, amen. Listen, my name is Gideon, and I get to serve as one of the pastors here at Christ Fellowship. And if there's anything that I'm thankful for, I'm thankful for today, the opportunity to spend with you all our last day in diving deeper into God's word. Listen, it's the New Year's. And I know that whenever the New Year's comes up, we all have an opportunity to make some, some drastic changes or some small changes in our life by making these New Year's resolutions. And if there's anything if there's any change or any resolution that you should make, you already know this. I'm a pastor, we're a church. I'm going to come at you with this. You already know what's going to happen. That you should resolve in your life to obey the word of the Lord. If there's any resolution that you're going to make, make this resolution. Make the resolution that you are obedient to the word of the Lord. That you're not just a hearer of the word of God, but you're also a doer of the word of God as well. Right? And so as we end 2023 and we get ready to embark upon 2024, Make that your resolution. In fact, that's going to be our topic for today. We're going to be in the book of James, and I would encourage you, if you have your Bible, to open it up to the book of James. We're going to be in chapter 1, verses 22, and I have my boy here somewhere. Drew, come, come join us. My boy Jeremiah here, who is going to join us, and he is going to do the scripture reading for today. You ready, bub? Yep. All right, let's do it. James chapter 1, verse 22. But be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. All right, read it one more time. We want to, we want to drive it home here. James chapter 1, verse 22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Amen. Thank you, Bob. This is the word of the Lord. If you're not seated, you can be seated. But listen, there is a charm, right? Let's read it one more time. James chapter 1, verse 22. It says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. I'll stop there for a moment. And I want to set it up by asking this question. How many of you have heard of the phrase, I grew up in the church? Right, you've, you've probably used that yourself. You found yourself in a, in a conversation and someone's asking you, hey, share your testimony with me. And you would respond with, I grew up in the church. Or maybe you heard somebody else say, hey, I grew up in the church. But you know, the thing about that phrase is that it means different things to different people. And so whenever I would find myself using that phrase, I grew up in the church, I mean that in a literal sense. Being the fact that I found myself in a church building like four or five times out of the week, it was crazy. Listen, Wednesday was midweek service. Thursday was choir rehearsal. Friday was youth group. Uh, um, Saturday, at an ungodly hour, there was prayer. There's a prayer meeting at four o'clock in the morning. Who does that? Well, we did. And then on Sunday, for two hours a day, we spent, we spent that at the church building, worshiping the Lord. And listen, I, I wish I could tell you that out of all the days that I spent growing up in the church, that I grew into be a, a strong believer at that, that age and point in my life. But, but, I, but the truth is I didn't. I mean, as much as I found myself in the church building, I really missed Jesus. And, and get this, the only reason why I went to church is because my parents told me that I had to go to church, right? And if, if you know anything about the Samoan culture, I'm Samoan, but if you know anything about the Samoan culture, it's kind of expected that you grow up to do the things of the Lord. And get this, that's not a bad thing in of itself. I think that's a very, very beautiful thing. Like, that my, my culture is deeply rooted in faith. But what I'm trying to sell, tell you here is that I, I had no real personal faith with God. In fact, when I think about it, my relationship with God was more of a relationship with the church building. I had head knowledge about God. I learned about God. Um, I heard about God, but I had no real desire to put what I learned about God into action. I had no desire to pursue him, no desire to carry out his word, none of that. And so as it would go, the older I got, I would eventually stop going to church altogether because the Lord, the things of the Lord just kind of took a bat seat because I had no desire for him. And so sadly, I, I prioritized what was most important to me, and, and the Lord back at that season just wasn't important to me at that time. So I would graduate from high school. I would go on to college, and after undergrad, I moved down here to the city of Miami to pursue work in education reform. And it was when I moved here to Miami that I began to look for a church. And I wish I could tell you that I was looking for a church because I was desiring God, but I wasn't. I was looking for a church to cover up a lie. You know, before I accepted the job down here in Miami, I had a conversation with my parents and I told them, hey, don't worry about me. I'm going to find a church. I'm going to get plugged into biblical community. I'll be A-OK. -okay. Two years into living here in Miami, I've done no such thing. 
And it's not because I couldn't find a church. It's because I wasn't looking for a church. And the entire time that I've been living here, the first two years, I've been lying to my parents saying, hey, I found a church. Don't worry. It's good. I'm all A-OK. And then one day, my, my father would call, and he would tell me, he's like, hey, I'm going to be in town. Let's go to that church that you've been telling me about. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, yeah, that's what we're doing? OK. And I do what any liar would do when you get caught in a lie. You tell some more lies. And so I was telling my dad, like, yeah, man, it's great. It's the best church in Miami. You're not going to want to leave. You, you might want to move down here. This is an amazing church. I mean, I'm lying through my teeth, have no idea what I'm, what I'm talking about. So I hang up the phone, and I remember going to Google and searching these three words, church near me, and then Christ Fellowship downtown would pop up. And I knew this church because I had some coworkers who attended this church. And so I'm thinking to myself, I was like, well, this is a godsend. This is easy. I got it in the bag. All I have to do is go ask my coworkers, hey, tell me what this church is about. What time do we have to be there? And what do you need to wear? I'm going to tell all that information to my father. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Money in the bag. As it would go, I ended up going to church by myself. My dad couldn't even make it. But I go to church in the fall of 2010, and it's the start of this brand new series entitled Authentic Faith. And as I'm sitting there in the second pew from the front, I'm looking at the screen, and I see Pastor Rick, and I'm thinking to myself, well, this is odd. This is different. The pastor's coming through a screen, but what he was saying was convicting me. It was weighing on me so much so. And he said, hey, this, this new series that we're in, it's called Authentic Faith. We're going to walk through the book of James, and we're going we're to talk about what that looks like in terms of having this real faith. And the crux of his message was, th was this. You ought not to call yourself a Christian if you don't live like one. He would go on to say, don't, don't say that you're a follower of Jesus if you're not following the way of Jesus. Listen, that, that hit me like a ton of bricks. You know why? Because before I stepped foot in that church building, I gave a lot of lip service to God, meaning that I found myself in conversations with my groups of friends. Whenever the topic of religion would come up, I would always be the first one to say, he's like, yeah, I love God. I know God. I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of him. He said, I, I thought that I was a good person. I lived by the golden rule. I treated others the way I wanted to be treated. I, I volunteered in my community. I gave back to those who were in need. I prayed over my food. I prayed over my grades, my tests. I prayed for a parking spot when I needed one. And I was like, yeah, I'm a Christian. I know exactly what it means to follow God. But then I would keep going back to Christ's fellowship. Day after day, weekend after weekend, and as we were working through this Authentic Faith series, I would become more convicted. And I started to ask myself this question. Do I, do I really have this authentic faith that this pastor is talking about? Because here's what I realized. That I was talking the talk, but I definitely wasn't walking the walk. My actions didn't match my speech. And for the first time that I could remember, I felt like the biggest hypocrite. And I knew, to, I knew right then and there, like, man, something, something has to change. And so as I'm, as I'm going there to the church, I, I thank God because his grace, he allowed me to see this. And he allowed me to have this conviction set root in my heart that I needed to change something. That I know that I was being a hearer of God's word, but I definitely wasn't being a doer of God's word. And here's the reason why I share this story. Because the truth is, that's, that's the reality for many professing Christians today. There are many people who profess to be a follower of Jesus, yet they live their own way. Maybe you know some people like that in your family. Maybe your friends Perhaps your coworkers who say, hey, I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of Jesus, yet you see how they live their lives. Maybe I'm talking about you today. Maybe you're feeling like, in 2023, I, I started to follow God. I tried to do all the things that I needed to do, and I'm just, it's, just, it's just not working out for whatever reason. And you're thinking to yourself, in 2024, I just need to get right with God. Listen, wherever you are in your journey with your walk, uh, with the Word and your walk with the Lord, Understand this, and this is the big idea that I'm trying to articulate here, the, the, my proposition, what I want you to get uh, as we spend our time today. The big idea is this. Authentic faith will obey God's word. Authentic faith will obey God's word. That raises a couple of questions. What does it look like to have this authentic faith? And then when you talk about being obedient to God, there's so many areas and so many places that I could start. Where do I even start when it comes to being obedient to the word of God? If you're thinking those questions... Or perhaps you feel like you're a mature believer and you feel like, hey, I'm walking with the Lord. Listen, the truth is, if you ask the Lord to search your heart, there are areas that you need to be more obedient to. Whether you are a mature believer or a young believer, the word of the Lord has something to say. And that's what I pray that the Holy Spirit would reveal to you as we spend our time together. So again, if you have your, your Bibles, please turn to the book of James. We're going to be in chapter 1, verses 22. And with that being said, I would encourage you to take notes. 
Uh, and if you're taking notes, I have two thoughts. You can write this down as number one. We must know God's word and obey God's word. We must know God's word and obey God's word. Look at verse 22. Verse 22 says this, but be doers of the word and not hearers only. Now stop there. James is saying to be doers of the word and not hearers only. Now get this, some context here is that James is writing a group of Christians who are fleeing persecution. And as they're fleeing persecution, they are in a, an extreme season of suffering. And get this, out of all the things that James could encourage them with, out of all the things that James could remind them with, he chooses to remind them, hey, I know that you heard the word of God. Just remember that you're obeying the word of God. Now, why, why would he do that? Especially when they're suffering. If I'm suffering, encourage me to, that I'm going to make it, that I'm going to get through. But instead, he encourages these Christians and says, hey, remember to obey the word of God. But think about it for a minute here, right? Think about you and me for a moment. Isn't it true that whenever we're going through a difficult season, oftentimes we are most susceptible or vulnerable to sinning? I'm not saying this is the only time we sin, but oftentimes we try to take matters into our own hands. And oftentimes we go against the word of God and we sin against God. So it makes sense that James would tell these Christians who are fleeing persecution and who have this deep suffering that they're going through, hey, obey the word of God. You know, the reminder that he is telling these Christians back then is the same reminder that he's telling you and me today. That regardless of whatever season that we're in, obey the word of God. The truth is this, when everything is going your way, when your marriage is great, your boyfriend and girlfriend is great, work is great, grades are great, the children are behaving, it's easy, it's easy to praise God. It's easy to obey God. But the moment that tragedy would strike, the moment that we would go through just an inkling of suffering, oftentimes we, we, we start to sin, we start to go against the will of God, we take matters into our own, our own hands. And so the reminder here that James is telling us here in verse 22, to be not only hearers but doers of the word of God is a reminder for us today that regardless of whatever season that we're in, obey the word of God. Basically what he's saying, he says that your entire life needs to be characterized. Your entire life needs to be characterized by doing the word of God. Again, verse 22, it says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only. But why? Why does it matter? Why does it matter that we are not only hearers of the word, but doers as well? Well, keep reading. Look at verse 22 again. But be doers of the word and not hearers only. And then those next two words, deceiving yourselves. Deceiving yourselves. This is what James is saying. He says that it's not enough to be content with knowing God's word. You need to apply God's word to your life. He says, just like me, I deceived myself to believing I was a true believer. I had all this head knowledge about God, but I didn't apply it to my life. I professed to be a follower of Jesus, yet I habitually followed my sin. I gave a lot more lip service to God more than I actually submitted to God. Now think about it, family. If you truly believe something, wouldn't you show it? Wouldn't you behave in such a way that you show that I truly, truly do believe this? Take, for example, our freedom. Right? I think that all of us who are watching today, we value our freedom, right? You value your freedom. You want your freedom. And, and in order for us to be able to keep our freedom, we have to obey the law of the land. So get this. There's a consequence and an incentive, right? If we don't obey the law of the land, we lose our freedom. If we obey the law of the land, we get to keep our freedom. So we value freedom so much so that it changes the way that we live. We obey it. You can say that we are hearers of the law of the land, and we are also doers of the law of the land. Why? Because we value, we value our freedom. Take, for instance, the speed limit, right? We obey the speed limit, most of us. I see how some of you drive, especially with the bumper sticker on. It's crazy. But we obey the speed limit, right? The consequence is if we don't obey the speed limit, we can lose our driving privileges. The incentive, we get the, the freedom to drive wherever we want to drive. Or take, for instance, when you're children, right? When we're kids or we teach our kids not to lie and to steal, the consequence is you get a bow pow. The incentive, you don't get a bow pow. Right? You can say this, that we are hearers of the law of the land and doers of the law of the land because we value our freedom. It changes the way we live, so we obey the law. Why? Because we, we, we value our freedom. So let me ask you this question. Do you feel the same way about your spiritual freedom? Do you feel the same way when it comes to your spiritual freedom? Are you a hearer of the word of God and a doer of the word of God, or are you deceiving yourself? What James is saying, it's not enough to be content with just to know God's word. You have to apply God's word to your life. He says, if you don't, you are deceiving yourself. 
Now, when he uses the word deceive, the word deceive, it's a compound Greek word, para lagizomai. Para means to be beside, lagizomai is calculate. So basically, this here is a mathematical term. It means to miscalculate. And so here's what James is saying, essentially. If you call yourself a Christian, but you don't live like one, you have made a serious spiritual miscalculation. Something is not adding up here. Something is off here. The math ain't mathin'. How do you say that you're a follower of Jesus, but you live this way? Because get this, either we are true believers who know the word of God and obey the word of God, or we have deceived ourselves. We have deceived ourselves to thinking that because we are only hearers and not doers of the word of God. You know, here's a, here's a common theme that's found in the book of James. James is often referencing what Jesus would say when it comes to being a doer of the word. Here's what Jesus has to say in Matthew 7. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Listen, I can't put it any clearer than Jesus' words. True believers will do what the word of the Lord says to do. And, and verse 22, is, again, James 1.22, it says, to be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. And so what James does, he takes verse 22, and then he expands on verse 22 with an illustration in verse 23 and 24. Here's what it reads. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. So get this, this is what James is saying. A person who is a, a hearer of the word of God and not a doer of the word of God, he says that you have the same sense and stability of a person who is looking at the reflection in the mirror. And as they're looking at their mirror, the moment that they walk away, they instantly forget what they look like. That's crazy talk. Think about it this way, for instance. Take, for instance, this smaller mirror, right? There are one of two ways that you can use this mirror. The first way that you can use this mirror is you can take this mirror and you can turn it away from you to reflect something else, right? And so whenever I hold a mirror like this, I, I think of a specific time in my childhood. We would take a mirror like this and I, I grew up in one of the neighborhoods called um, Foxhorn Village. And on Foxhorn Village, I lived on a street called Steeplechase Court. And at the end of the street, at, really at the, be the beginning of the street, there was a huge electrical box that was surrounded with some bushes. And me and my friends, we would take a small handheld mirror like this and we would hide behind this electrical box. And what we would do is we would turn the mirror away from us. We would try to catch the sunlight to try to blind the drivers as they would come into the neighborhood. Definitely mischievous. And you can say for sure, we were not doers of the word of God. But don't miss, right? The idea is we would take this mirror, we would turn it away from us. We would try to reflect the, the sunlight, grab the sunlight and try to, to shine it in the driver's face to blind them as they're coming in. But don't miss the point. The point is this is the mirror, this mirror isn't the source of light. This mirror is a reflector of the light. And so what James is talking about here in verse 23 and 24, he is reminding me and you that we are living mirrors. Here's what that means. In the first book of the Bible, Genesis, it says that we are created in the image of God. It says that you and me, we are image bearers of the one who has created us. Simply put, we are living mirrors and we are created with the purpose to reflect God's glory to God's people all around us. So what James is saying here in verse 23 and 24, he's saying that if you are living in Christ, then inevitably you would reflect Christ. So that raises the question, what are you reflecting? Make no mistake about it, because if you are a hearer of the word of God and a doer of the word of God, your life would show it. Your life would reflect it. The question here is, what are you reflecting? What is your marriage reflecting? What is your purity reflecting? Whether you are single or in a dating relationship, what is your purity reflecting? What about your generosity? Does it reflect the heart of God? What does your time reflect? What is your speech, your action, your behavior, all of that? What does that reflect? Your thoughts, what is it reflecting? Is it reflecting the heart of Christ? Again, James 22 reminds us to, to not only be hearers of the word of God, but also be doers of the word of God. But another important function of a mirror is to take the actual mirror and to look at our reflection, right? And get this, whenever we're looking at our reflection in the mirror, we're looking to evaluate ourselves, right? You look at to evaluate your face, to evaluate your outfit, whatever it may be. And the idea is that when you're looking at your reflection in the mirror, you're looking at yourself, you do that for a reason. You do that to evaluate if something is off and then you do something about it. 
right? No one looks at a mirror and be like, oh, my hair is off or I have something hanging from my nose or, or there's something in my teeth and you just leave it there. You look in the mirror to see if there's something off and if something is off, you evaluate that, right? You, if something is off, you do something about it. And what James is saying in verse 23 and 24, he says, what healthy Christians do, they look at God's word as a mirror. Basically, they, what they would do is they would look into God's word to evaluate where they are in their walk with the Lord and then do something about it, not just to store up facts. Again, you're looking at the word of God as a mirror and you're looking at where you line up when it comes to living out the word of God. And if there is something off, you do something about it. You're not just storing up facts. You're not just hearing the word of God, but you are doing the word of God. We must know God's word and obey God's word. Let me ask you this question. Can you truly obey something that you don't know? How do you come to know who God is? Well, we come to know who God is through God's word, by studying his word, by reading his word, by praying through his word, by prioritizing his word. And when you come to know God, you come to know his heart, you come to know his will for your life, and you start to grow in your knowledge of the Lord. And here's what happens. You have the opportunity to be a doer of his word. You have an opportunity to live out God's word. Practically, what does that look like? Well, think about it this way, right? If you struggle with anger, here's what Proverbs 29, 11 says. Fools give full vent to their rage, but the wise bring calm in the end. If you struggle with jealousy, Proverbs 14, 30 says this. A heart at peace brings life to the body, but envy rots the bones. Maybe for you it's greed. 1 Timothy 6, 10 says this. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many pangs. Maybe you struggle with lust or sexual immorality. First Thessalonians says this, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you would become more like Jesus, that you abstain from sexual immorality. You see, hear, hear what the word of the Lord is saying. When you are hearing what the word of the Lord is saying, you're able to store that in your heart. Here, here's what it says in Psalm 119. Thy word I have hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Here's the reason why that matters, that you will just pursue the word, that you will pursue God by, by reading his word. Is when God's word starts to take root in your heart, the Holy Spirit will bring forth this conviction. And get this, you will feel conflicted. You will feel conflicted with what the word of God says and what your flesh desires. And the moment that you are facing temptation or a trial, the Holy Spirit instantly brings that word back to your mind. And you're confronted. You're confronted with an option to do. To do the word of God and not just to be a hearer of the word of God. You are instantly reminded of who you belong to and our obedience to the word of God. But get this. You can't just be a hearer. The moment that the Holy Spirit reminds you of the word that you've been meditating on, it does no good just to be a hearer of the word. It does no good just to be a knower of God's word. You have to apply it to your life. You can't just be a hearer of it. You've got to be a doer of it. Now allow me to demonstrate this by using some chocolate milk because who doesn't like chocolate milk? And so for this next illustration, I want to invite my beautiful family to join me as you guys take a seat here. Jude is giggly. And listen, for chocolate milk, you got to have the right ingredients for chocolate milk. And I say right ingredients because you need real milk, not oat milk like Abby and what she uses. So let's get the, let's get the right ingredients. Let's get some actual milk here and close that thing here. We need a spoon. Uh, then let's get uh, let's get two glasses, one for Jeremiah and one for Jude. Here you go, babe. Would you mind pouring a glass of milk there? And then, listen. What is uh, what is chocolate milk without chocolate syrup? You got to have the Hershey's chocolate syrup. So let's make some chocolate milk here. And so get this: when James says to be hearers of the word and not doers only, he says to be a hearer of the word. It's kind of like adding God's word to your life. And so take this. We'll say that the chocolate syrup, this represents the word of God. And this glass of milk, well, this glass of milk represents you and it represents me. And so when James says to be hearers of the word of God, that's like adding the word of God to our lives. So let's add the word of God to our lives. And so you add the word of God to your lives by going to church, by going to CF kids, CF students and adults, by studying the Bible, by reading the word, by praying through the Bible. You're adding God's word to your life. Same thing for Jude. Jude likes to laugh, and I th okay, I got it, baby. <laughs> You're adding the word of God to your life by going to see if kids, church, see if students, young adults, all of that good stuff. Reading the Bible, studying the Bible, you are adding the word of God to your life. And there you have it. You have added the word to your life. Now you have chocolate milk. Is that chocolate milk? Yeah, it's chocolate milk. Chocolate milk. Chocolate milk. Voila. Because when I see chocolate milk, usually I have to stir it up and it transforms it into chocolate milk. 
So, okay, so show us what, the, what you mean. You got a stir it. There's a spoon there. A nice good stir. Okay. So basically, Jeremiah, what you're saying that it does no good for the chocolate just to sit there. You have to do something to the chocolate. There has to be an action. Yes. You got to stir it up and then it transforms into chocolate milk. Yes. That'll preach. Okay. Well, listen, enjoy your milk. How about you give your brothers a good stir here? You know how to stir it? Okay. He's a three-nager. Big baby. Okay. Well, listen, you guys enjoy your chocolate milk, babe. I'll let you guys go to the back. You can have that back there. Do what you guys got to do. You see, just like how you have to stir the chocolate to transform the milk into chocolate milk, listen, what James is saying here is it does no good for the Word of God to just sit in your life. You have to apply it to your life. You have to do something with the Word of God that you know. You have to allow God's Word to transform your heart and the way that you live. And so this is kind of the idea and the difference between behavior modification and heart transformation. There's a difference here. So when it comes to behavior modification, I often think about a lot of the people that I've seen who have started with God, especially in my journey when I was walking with the Lord at my early stages. There are a lot of people who I've seen start with God who are no longer with God. And listen, there's no judgment pass. And oftentimes when I think about that person, I, I, I pray for their salvation. But perhaps they have deceived themselves, just like I have. Right, maybe they were a hearer of the Word of God and not a doer of the Word of God. And, and maybe they deceived themselves to believing that they were a true believer. But that's what behavior modification is. What behavior modification does, it tries to force yourself to live a certain way. But the reason why that never works, the reason why it's always temporary is because our hearts will always do what our hearts desire. Jeremiah reminds us that our heart is wicked and evil. It will deceive us time and time and time again. That's why behavior modification, trying to force yourself to live a certain way, never works. But on the other hand, when there's heart transformation, when your heart is being transformed by the gospel over and over and over again, and the process, your behaviors will change. There's a difference. And when your heart is transformed, that's a permanent thing. Remember this, our, 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 our first takeaway is that we must know God's word and also obey God's word. And one of the indicators that your heart is being transformed by the gospel, you can write this down as number two, is we know we have authentic faith, when we continue to obey God's word. We know we have authentic faith when we continue to obey God's word. Look at verse 25 now. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. The key word here is perseveres. And this comes from the Greek word parameno. That means to examine your soul, to examine the state of your soul. And so what James is doing, he's going back to the mirror metaphor, and he's talking about a person who spends much time in the mirror. Now, you know people who spend a lot of time in the mirror, right? You know that. But they spend much time in the mirror because they're evaluating, they're examining the state of their face. What he is saying is for a Christian who has authentic faith, they will live and behave in that, in that way to the point where they're going to look at God's word and they're going to examine the state of their soul to see what is off. And if there's anything off, they're going to do something about it. Here's the reason why that matters, because genuine faith calls for obedience that endures. Genuine faith calls for obedience that endures. To examine the state of your soul continuously shows that you truly do believe what you believe. You're not just a hearer of God's word, but you are a doer of God's word. Like, and this is not a one and done deal. This is someone who hears the word of God and does the word of God and they keep doing the word of God. They continue, as James says, they persevere. Look at what Luke says. Luke 11, Jesus put it plainly. He says this, Blessed, rather, are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Other translations say, and practice it. Blessed are those who keep it. See, again, keeping God's word and doing God's word isn't just one and done thing. You continue to live a life, to lead a life that honors God above all else. You are, you are ongoing, you're keeping on with doing the word of God in every day and every aspect of your life. This means that your entire life is marked. Your entire life is marked by, by God's word. Get this, people who do God's word, they love God and belong to God. John 14 puts it this way. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. First John 5 says this, by this we know we have love for the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep, that we keep his commandments. John 14 says this, Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's 
who sent me. Simply put, if we are hearers of the word of God and not doers of the word of God, we aren't worshiping God. We are worshiping ourselves. We're worshiping our own agenda. But listen, when we submit to God in all areas of our life, then and only then can we truly become not just hearers of the word of God, but also doers. People who are obedient to the word of God. Our hearts will begin to be transformed by the gospel. And get this, you know, one of the best ways that you can grow in your relationship with God is through a small group. It's in a small group, in a biblical community, that can form friendships. You can study the word of God together and you can find much needed, much needed accountability. It was in a small group for me that I was able to study God's word, that I was able to build uh, friendships and relationships that I found much needed accountability. It was in my first small group that I started to grow from being a hearer of God's word, but to also being a doer of God's word. It was in my small group that I went from spending two hours on a Sunday to then now living in Jesus. John 8 says this, if you abide in my word, if you live in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Well, free from what? You want to know why all of this matters? All of this matters because our obedience to the word of God brings freedom from sin and death. That's why this matters. The word of God just isn't a beautiful piece of literature to be savored and enjoy. Uh, it, it goes beyond provoking thought and inviting meditation. It requires more than memorization and sharing it. It demands a change of heart that prompts a change of behavior. The word of God is to be obeyed. Maybe you're here and you'd say, well, pastor, I'm a doer of the word. I've been following God for much of my life. I'm a doer of the word. I'm not just a hearer. I know that I'm obeying God. Praise God for that. The truth is this. If you ask God to search your heart, he will reveal to you areas in your life, in your heart that you need to surrender to God even more so. Areas that you need to be more obedient to. In a moment, we're going to pray. And as we pray, I would encourage you to ask the Lord to search your heart. And whatever those areas are that you aren't surrendering fully to God, that you know that you need to, that you know that you're not being obedient to, repent and ask the Lord that he would stir in your heart an affection to obey his word. Perhaps you've been watching this entire time and you have been wrestling with what the word of the Lord says. Maybe you're not a believer. And I would just say this to you, before you can even be a doer of the word of God, you first need to be a hearer of the word of God. Specifically, you need to be a hearer of the gospel message. And the gospel message is what, is what Jesus has done for you. And so if you are here and you're watching, it's like, man, I, I want to start 2024 on the right foot. I need to give my life to Jesus. I want you to hear what the gospel is for you. Here's what it reads in Romans chapter 3, verses 23. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every single person, myself included, every single person that is watching, all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. We were born into a sinful world, a broken world. And because of that, we are alienated from a very perfect and righteous God. So everybody, every single person that scripture says, we have fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23 says this, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. What are wages? Wages is something that we earned. And it says this, for the wages of sin is death. What do we earn because of our sin? We earn death. And this is not talking about a physical death. Every single person, we will die a physical death. This is talking about a spiritual death, a, a, a separation for eternity with the God who created you. This is what we earn because of our sin. We earn a, an eternal separation, a death, a spiritual death from the God who created us. But it goes on to say this, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know what a gift is? A gift is what we got last week for Christmas. Those are things you don't even have to work for. People gave it to you because they loved you. That's what the salvation is. The salvation is a gift to you. It comes from God. You don't have to do anything to earn it. You don't have to do anything to work for your salvation. It says the free gift of God is eternal life. And where's that eternal life? In Christ Jesus, our Lord. It goes on to say this. This is how much that gift costed. Romans 5, 8. But God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners... Christ died for us. That means while you were mocking, ridiculing God, while you were living and habitually living in your sin, God still died for you. He would pay the price once and for all that we might have eternal life, that we might have eternal life with God. So how do you receive this gift? Romans 10, 9 says this, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, 
you will be saved. You might be thinking to yourself, there's no way that a person like me could be saved. God, does God even have an idea of anything and everything that I've done? If you feel like you are too far out of reach of the Lord's saving arm, let me remind you of this, Romans 10, 13. It says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You know who's everyone? You're everyone. And so if you are listening to this service right now and you feel like I need to start 2024 off in the right foot, I first just need to accept I need to repent and believe and to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. For those of you who are believers, you say, hey, I'm a true believer. I've been following the Lord again. My encouragement and my challenge to you is that you would ask the Lord to search your heart. And if there's any area in your life that you know you aren't surrendering to God, that you aren't being fully obedient to God, that you would make that happen. You would make that resolution to do that now in 2024. So wherever you are, whether you are a believer or not, I'd ask that you would pray. Would you pray with me? Father God, I I lift up those who are listening to this message right now. God, first and foremost, I thank you for the opportunity to be able to share and teach your word with our people today. God, I pray for those who are believers, those who have been walking with you for quite some time, who are not only hearers but doers of the word. God, I pray that you would continue to reveal to them areas in their life that we need to be more obedient in. And Lord, I pray that you would convict them, that you would stir their heart for more affection for you in this way. And God, right now, take a moment to pray for those who may not be believers, those who are desiring to be in communion with you. And as I'm praying, if that's you, if I'm talking to you, if you today, you want to make a decision to follow Jesus Christ. If that is you right now, I just quietly, wherever you are, I want you to repeat after me. Say, Father God, I recognize that I'm a sinner in need of saving. Lord, I ask that you would forgive me for my sins. God, I ask that that you would help me to repent of my old ways and to turn to follow you. God, I believe in my heart and I'm confessing with my mouth that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. And so, God, I pray that you would help me live the balance of my life, loving you and serving you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, listen, if you made a decision to follow Jesus, Know that you have made the most important decision that you can ever make at the end of this year and at the beginning of next year. And that's the decision to follow Jesus Christ. And listen, we are excited and and pumped for you. We're happy that you have made this decision and know that it's not it. This is not it. Like there's more for you. And we have the desire to help you grow in your walk with the Lord. Again, our mission is simple. It's to help you and your family follow Jesus. And one of the best ways that we can do that, especially if you made a decision to follow Jesus, is to connect with us. Listen, you're going to see this come up at the bottom of the screen, cfmiami.org slash connect. If you had made that decision, man, pause this broadcast, go to this website or scan this QR code. It's going to send you to this connection card. Fill this information out. And whatever campus you're near, whatever campus you attend, one of our pastors will follow up with you to help you take your next step of faith. Well, family, I hope that this message has encouraged you. I pray that it not only challenged you, but also uh, encouraged you in that way. And so wherever you are in your journey and your walk with the Lord, I pray that 2024 would be a year that is marked by your obedience to the word of God. We love you all. What a powerful sermon by Pastor Gideon. Uh, man, wasn't it, it's, what, a, what a great, powerful teaching. Thank you so much for sharing with us, uh, Pastor Gideon. And uh, listen, I hope that this sermon encouraged you and helped you end the year well. Uh, if you gave your life to Christ, listen, we rejoice with you, man. We're excited that you're starting your walk with the Lord. And so we want to help you take steps in your walk with him. And so if you don't mind, go to cfmiami.org slash connect. And uh, when you fill out that form, one of our pastors will reach out to you in the next upcoming days. And we're going to help you take steps in your walk with Christ. So join us next. So join us next Sunday in person. We're back in person at all of our campuses uh, because I will be bringing a special message uh, about how to start the year strong and have good, healthy spiritual habits. And so I think it's going to be a message that's going to set us up well for the entire year. So listen, do not come alone. Bring your friends and family. Bring someone with you. And let's start off the year right next week. All right. Listen, have a happy new year. Stay safe. We love you all.